to welcome you all in this faculty development program of Baudhik Atmanirbharta. It is about Bharat Ki Gyan Paramparai, organized by Center of Excellence for Indian Knowledge System. I am extremely overwhelmed to get this opportunity to address you all on this brightest occasion of the conversation with Sri J. Sai Deepakji and Professor Joy Sain Sir. Dear friends, it is said by Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan that it is the intense spirituality of India and not only political structure or social organization that it has developed that has enabled it to resist the ravages of time and the accidents of history. Dear friends, some people say that India came into existence on 15th August 1947. What do you think? Is that true? Today we are going to answer such kind of questions. And in Rigaveda, Rigaveda says that Satya Nota Bhita Bhumihi Surya Nota Bhita Dayoho Rate Na Ditya Rishthanti Divi Somo Adhi Sharitaha It means that truth is the base that bears the earth. By Surya are the heavens sustained. By law, the Aditya stands secure, and Soma hold his peace place in heaven. So, I request our guest, the truth speakers of the century, to assume their seat on the dais. We have among us the interviewers, uh, Sri Purushottam. He is a student of IIT Khadakpur and PG representative of IIT Khadakpur. We have among us. Uh, Digvijay Punia, he is a student of first year law. Once again, Sadar Pranam to what and all, to my esteemed guests. Uh, before we begin, so we, we want to talk a little about the book, uh, India that is Bharat. So, Sri Sai has already written another second version of that uh, installment of that book. Uh, but we'll uh, restrict our talks today to the first book. And uh, so when I picked that book up, sir, uh, already I had few thoughts about how the colonity has impacted. But what, what, we, what I gained out of that book was that every third or fourth page I have marked a pen mark. Like, okay, this is something that needs to be explored. So on that way, th this book has been enlightening. Like, like everything seems to be very simple. Like even the basic constitution seems to be, we being students of law, the constitution seems to be a, a holy book that has been like, if not came from heaven, but uh, stalwarts like Dr. Ambedkar and all have, have, have prepared it. But once we go into your book and read it, then we realize it's an exercise. In an, it's an exercise by some of our uh, intellectual people who were there. But then were they also, uh, you know, reminiscent of the problems that we might face now or were they aware of the history? So was that history being put in into that, uh, you know, uh, the, is it visible in that constitution or the articles of that constitution or the polity that is being practiced today? So your book uh, enlightens us about that. I'm very thankful to you for writing it. And uh, some of our questions will, uh, the answers that we could not get, I hope I'll get them today. Uh, through my questions. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sain, uh, your book, uh, The Aryan Invasion That Never Was, uh, uh, was really intriguing in the sense that it had particularly captured the evidences that proved that Aryan Invasion was a myth. And uh, on this, uh, we will be setting up uh, the concept of how that book happened and maybe you will be able to elucidate on the on getting the book on the ground level so my so my my fundamental gripe uh, shri saiji with your book or my fundamental problem with your book is that it talks about decoloniality however this entire exercise i mean is like looking back through the same tunnel that we got out of we are looking through the same prism back uh, we are trying uh, when we are reading that book instead of let's say creating our own version of it say for example you know like it's like calling yourself non-left, reading yourself in the perspective of whatever, what already has been established. So why not then like uh, 
use the terms like say the rena renaissance or the enlightenment or the age of discovery which you have touched upon in your book also. So why not, why use the term decoloniality or post colonial uh, you know deconstruction and not use the terms let us say age of ancients or rise of ancients or the eastern awakening. So why did you choose it uh, as a decoloniality, I mean the terminology as such? You seem to be comfortable with the concept of decolonization when it is undertaken in the context of Africa, it is when it is undertaken in the context of Latin America and you seem to be appalled at all the mass graves which are unearthed under schools uh, where let us say indigenous peoples and their children were murdered and they were found under to show a similar example as far as Bharat is concerned both in the past and the present. Somehow I become the fascist who seems to be purveying some kind of a politically incorrect view. And, and so I decided to perform the exercise of first explaining. If you wish to understand colonization as a project, it makes very little sense to understand it purely from the perspective of Bharat. Look at it globally and then ask yourself why would the European colonizers attitude or behavior be any different as far as Bharat is concerned. If the consequence of his colonization is that it leaves Latin America Christianized, it leaves Canada Christianized, it leaves Australia Christianized, it leaves New Zealand Christianized and somehow the moment he comes to Bharat he apparently developed a secular conscience and that we were the exception to his rule without realizing that if you are around and if this culture is still around. The credit cannot go to the benevolent nature of the colonizer but must go to the inherent spiritual strength of this particular country and its civilization and therefore I wanted to confront it. And from there comes the second tangent, I would not say a tangent perhaps a sequitur or the corollary to that particular position that if this happens to be one of those few societies which has managed to survive the ravages of a clear evangelical colonization experience. How do we still continue to value under the notion that this is a defeatist defeated society? And that is something that I wanted to push in terms of a very clear position. Three, uh, a society such as ours will undergo three levels of analysis according to me. First is the awareness or the consciousness of the layers of coloniality that you are buried under. Second is a clear understanding of the extent of coloniality which may vary from subject to subject and three would be a prescription in terms of what is the way forward. So awareness, diagnosis followed by prognosis or prescription. If I were to be engaging with a society which is already aware, I could have proceeded to two and three directly, steps two and three directly. But when I try and make lots of population in this country which continue to believe that we have not suffered any such thing or there are no unconscious or subconscious impacts of colonization whatsoever, I am still at step one where I am trying to convince and having to convince people that such an impact continues to exist. So if I, if, if, if the consensus on step one has not been arrived at yet, where is the question of me moving to step two and step three? because then I would be jumping the gun. So the idea was to lay out the problem identification so to speak from an opportunity perspective that this is the nature of the problem, this is the quality of the problem and this is the effect of the problem in multiple areas. At the very least I have identified a few high level verticals such as caste, religion, identity, nature, so on and so forth and environment of course and then said this is the impact of colonization. It is across the world. It just so happens that because of your resistance or your reactions, there is a change in the manner in which it has affected you. But the intention of the colonizer has been uniform and at the very least largely the same and broadly the same across the world. So I had no other option but to start with that particular mechanism. But perhaps a simpler example would be to draw from what Swami Vivekananda said. There would perhaps come an unfortunate time when Indians or Bharatiyas would find value in their own culture when the Westerner repackages the very same culture and sends it to them saying Tathasto now read it, right. 
So, until Bharatiya knowledge comes from the Abhaya Hastam of the Westerner, we may not be open to it. So, I said, well, finally, the colonizers, descendants themselves seem to be acknowledging the consequences of what their ancestors did. And yet, somehow, the victims and the descendants of the victims continue to value under the impression nothing has happened. In line with the question of coloniality and decoloniality, uh, my question to Professor Sain is, uh, what is this Aryan invasion theory? And why do you think it needs to be discussed in the current times? And how does it connect with coloniality? Okay, a very good evening. Uh, first, at the outset, it's wonderful to sit next to Sai. Uh, because this sitting is just not a frame on the stage. It talks about two generations, you know. And I think there's a rising consciousness, you know, from JS to JSD. <laughs> yeah. So, and I take this full opportunity too because we let's behave like IITians. It's a free stage. IIT ka tempo? Aye. That's it. That was Sai's post today. So I want to take a full blaze of that. And uh, Sai has wonderfully uh, set the stage, clarified the three steps. I'll make a small story, and I think this is a story which has gone through many eyes and uh, reading here and there. It's about 1492, we, we call it the fall of Granada. 1492, the fall of Granada. There's a preceding seven to eight years, uh, centuries of civilization in Europe, when the Moors, the loosely called Arabs, or the Abbasid, dynasty from the tip of Iran and Iraq was transferring the knowledge of Asia to the Cordova of Emirate. So all the knowledge, you know, mathematics to culinary habits, the way you cook today in a kitchen, you know, from tapestry to you compose a music was getting transferred to West Europe. Till that point of time, you can check from history till about 13th 14th century, Europe was never known as Europe. It was known as Andalusia, which means the end of Asia. So, the tip of Iberia, Spain and Portugal was known as Ant al Ushia, which means the end of Asia. So, Asia Minor was India, China, Persia, Asia Major, I'm sorry, Asia Major. I'm getting excited to sit next to Sai, so I'm making mistakes. And Asia Minor is Anatolia, that's Turkey. And it goes up to Atalia, which is Italy, so they're bearing the same names. And then finally, Andalusia, which is Iberia. What happened uh, in the, in the Judeo-Islamic line of civilization, there was a conflict which was also going with the other line of the three Semitic religions, which is a Judeo-Christian. And that was opening up crusades at both ends of Europe. One was Iberia, I'm making the story smaller, and one was Constantinople. So between 1453 to 1493, there was a change in the fulcrum. I mean, it's like a, it's like a Libra. Uh, and what happened? Uh, the Islamic supremacy of Europe in the West went down, and it slipped out of the hands and went into the hand of the Frank Frankish kings, and then the other thing happened on the side which is Constantinople. The Christian supremacy in Byzantium went into the hand of the Ottoman Turks. This is the backdrop. And then the entire Christian civilization in Iberia, including France, sort of absorbed and downloaded the entire Oriental wisdom and developed a vocabulary of science, technology, culture, and everything. And then the expedition started, which was sponsored by Ferdinand and Isabelle, uh, yeah, the coloniality, uh, which is whole of size concern. And we have people like the Basques coming to India, which is Vasco, and the Vasco da Gama and Megalan. And there was one guy, a very interesting person, who read the Indian scripts and saw that the earth is not really flat, it's actually round. So the, he wanted to reach the Indies taking the western route. That's Christopher Columbus. And that's why we call the, the early Native Americans as Indians, and by mistake, 
uh, and correcting the mistake that today they are known as Red Indians. Now that's the whole story. So when a uh, hundred years fast forward, these people come to India, the Portuguese, the Jesuit monks on the Konkan coast, uh, about 1590 onward till about 1620, they, in a series of about 10 to 15 years, started observing fantastic similarities between the words that they had brought in from Europe and that they find in India. You know, I think you're all aware of it. Simple words like three, which means three, and khetra, which is a four square, which means four, quadro, and pancham, which is pented. But very uh, powerful words like the sarpa, which is a serpent, and and then more scientific words like the jara, a three, which is the geriatrics, which is the science of old age, and asthi, pathi, which becomes osteopathy, and so on and so on. And padhatri, which becomes pediatrics. So they're very worried, uh, 16th, 17th century. And this worry had two branches. One was linguistics, and other was political, economical. But they're looking for an answer. I'm making the brief very quick. Uh, and then they found out a very interesting word in the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, also partly in the Atharva Veda, but mostly in the Rig Veda, which is Arjo. And, uh, and they saw different expressions of these special people with certain noble ideas, but having a bearing with colors of consciousness which they interpreted to be skin colors, skin colors, uh, the colonial rulers. And when the colonial supremacy on Asia was gaining prominence, and the GDP of Asia as a whole, which was highest till about the 15th century was collapsing, then the colonial rulers needed a theory, they needed a ism, they needed a, some kind of a package through which they could prove that about a few thousand years prior to the British and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the Germans coming to the Orient, there are probably one earlier branch of Caucasus people who had either come from Europe and waiting in the stapes, or from the stapes they had moved to Europe at some point of time, and they're pretty nomadic, pretty barbaric. But when they enter Iran and particularly India, they all of a sudden become civilized. They start meditating. They start composing the sutras. And they formulate the language that they're speaking in the stapes, the proto-Sanskrit, into a more formulated form of Sanskrit. And then some archaeologists like Montemary Wheeler and others saw some uh, archaeological evidence of some destruction in the Indus Valley. And then they say, this must be an invasion, which was caused by the people coming from the stapes. So much before, we are coming to the Orient and re-civilizing Asia, and particularly India. There is a history in the passage of time about 3,000 years back. And they had a very interesting time period based on the biblical Asher Lightfoot chronology of about uh, 5,000 BC and nothing before that, you know, by calculating the years of the Bible. And so they had to package everything within 2000 BC because it coincided with the Greek civilization and the dates of Buddha and Confucius and Lao Tzu in China. And they forged, they manipulated, and they organized a very interesting theory of a group of people a huge horde of people coming from the Caucasus and invading Asia. The Aryans by skin, the Aryans by genetics, the Aryan by apathite, and Aryan by colonization. And this became the Aryan invasion theory. Now why they did that? Because it had two advantages. One is they can distort the historic chronology of India and package the whole thing and contain the whole thing within 2000 BC. And the other thing is that they can create a pedagogy of education, which is actually guided and streamlined by this Aryan invasion myth. 
and telling to the Bharatiyas, their Indians, that all that you have inherited from the past, whatever good and civilization has come from the steppes or from Europe or from the, or, or, or from the Rhineland, and all that possibly you have inherited from your own land is magic, superstition, and not of much science. So you need an education system which, you are bring, which we are bringing right now. And this was broadly started by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Uh, some of his speeches may not be true, but he definitely shuttled between India and the British Parliament and a number of times. And he systematically reported uh, the looseness of the Indian fabric, a land of assimilation. And it was taken up by a particular person in a very powerful way with the aid of Lord Cornwallis. His name was Randolph Winston Churchill. He was the father of Winston Churchill. So Randolph Churchill came to India and founded the missionary education on the one hand. And very systematically, he started forming education and policies through which he started suppressing the traditional indigenous knowledge schools, the gurukuls of India. And as a branch of that, he brought in the missionary form of education to India. We're not speaking against the missionary system right here. What we are trying to say, it was not both. They were not complementary to each other. It was an either or paradigm. Either you take the missionary system and survive, or you don't take and perish. So this was the whole game theory of the Aryan invasion myth and how it got into our Indian education system and how our basic books of mathematics and everything so that all they could trace from the fall of Granada, whether it's mathematics, science, which could have gone from India to the Europe at certain later point of time, had actually come from Europe to India at a much earlier point of time. Hence, the Aryan invasion myth. So the moment we hear the word colonial, the picture that comes to our head is of British or Europe or Europeans. Now, the, my problem with that word is that it restricts us to the European prism and somehow makes us forget the invasion or what Sri Sai has re referred to as Middle Eastern colony. So, so she's like, how do you look at it that when you are referring to decolonization, are you only talking about the decolonization of Indian mind from the British impact or the European impact or are you also looking at the Middle Eastern colony, the invasion? Because, and there is a second question uh, element to this question, because when we think of European colonialism, we think of economic repression generally. But when we think of Middle Eastern colonialism, we think of it as a bloody invasion and rather than an economic uh, deprivation. So how do you uh, look at it when you are referring to only as decolonity and not as say invasion? Assuming for a moment that you apply the word colonization in a very broad sense. Colonization is an end result. Invasion could be one of those means to achieve colonization. So in that particular sense, I would apply the concept and the word of colonization both to the European experience as well as the pre-European Islamic experience. So which is why in chapter 6 of the book I have been very clear that it is going to be extremely difficult to discuss the layers of consciousness that Bharatiya consciousness is buried under without discussing both aspects. And why did I bring up both these aspects? Let me explain. So in the context of uh, Latin America, scholars who study the impact of colonization on Latin America have decided to ask themselves, okay, so what do we treat as the cutoff date to understand how did a pre-colonial Latin American experience look like? How did that particular society live? How do we make sense of it? Because you need some kind of a reference point, at least what well, let's call it a datum on the basis of which you decide before and after. And therefore they said that the Colombian expedition to Latin America shall be treated as the reference point, which is to say 
the experience of the society and the manner in which it lived prior to the Colombian expedition and its consequences post that. Now that made a lot of sense in the context of Latin America primarily because of its geographical location. There is perhaps to the best of my knowledge negligible history of any Islamic invasion of Latin America. Right? And prior to the Colombian expedition, they lived in their natural state as indigenous societies and not exactly in the form of nation states as we understand it. Now, if I were to replicate the very same principle to the Bharati experience, it would be impossible for me to limit myself only to the experience of the European colonization. I would have to go much before that. Because the experience prior to European colonization also is significantly in the form of settler colonization. So there are four or five different categories of colonization that have explained in the book based on literature of course, it's not my original contribution. So assume for a moment that one particular group chooses to use the other group or another territory primarily as a resource for assets or as a territory for minerals or human resources or whatever it may be then it is plain and simple exploitative colonization. But settler colonization is when there is sufficient incentive for the colonizing group to settle in the colonized territory in significant numbers and take over not just its administration. One of the litmus tests to understand whether a particular colonization translates to settler colonization is if you decide to set up education systems then it's a tertiary level of investment in the colonized society wherein you choose to recast the colonized society in the mold of the colonizing society using education as the process. Which is to say I don't limit myself to physical or political colonization but I want you to think like me. I want you to dress like me. I want you to speak like me. And I want you to think in the very same language as me which unfortunately Indians take a lot of pride in when they say that today I think in English, right? So that means that project has been accomplished, mission accomplished. And then to the extent that you go to the next step that not only do you start thinking like me, you also try and sever all relations with your ancestors, your pitris and your past. That is such a serious consequence for a philosophy that is based on a lot of pitri worship, on ancestor worship. So therefore, you're expected to spit on your past, think like the colonizer, that is the level of investment of a settler colonizer, which is exactly what happened with Bharat. Now, there is a reason why I would specifically apply this to all the Delhi Sultanates followed by the Mughal, uh, let's say, dynasty. Because prior to that, what happened? 7th century or rather 8th century, Muhammad bin Qasim comes, loots and goes away. So he is at best a looter, a plunderer and an invader of the, not even of the Alexandrian variety because he is not trying to establish a kingdom here. His intent is to loot, plunder, take the resource and go back. Now after the invasion of Sindh, it takes about three centuries for the Arabs and let's say the now fallen Afghanis who have now become from the Shahi Hindus, they have now become Muslims for them to start crossing to this side. Which is why 10th, 11th century with Muhammad Ghori becomes the most important, let's say timeline so to speak, the battle of Dharayam becomes the, becomes the most important uh, landmark. Because that effectively starts the establishment of a dynasty here. Starts with the Mamluks, the Khiljis, so on and so forth. And then finally of course the Mughal dynasty. So the establishment of a Sultanate with let's say your administration, your epicenters here, your capital here and all of that is a significant departure from the Arab looting. That's very, very different, right? So that effectively takes the form and shape and color and texture of settler colonization. So therefore, although in principle, according to, I mean, if I were to apply the logic of Latin America, I should be saying that around 10th century is what I would treat as the benchmark for Bharat to start understanding how we were before that. However, the Arab invasion of Sindh effectively translate to seizure of Sindh as a significant portion of the territory. 
what we associate as portions of Afghanistan or let's say or let's say even par parts of Khorasan or Persia that you see today. Okay, let's let me do a sim uh, sample poll here. How many of you believe whenever you have seen the map of undivided Bharat or Akhand Bharat, do you see Afghanistan anywhere in the picture? Right, you don't. But until the Mauryan period, this was a part of undivided Bharat. So imagine that even in popular consciousness, you have given upon Afghanistan as part of undivided Bharat. It's not as if you have Pakistan today. It's not as if you have POK today. But your aspiration is someday this is undivided Bharat, at least some portions of it. But even in that aspiration, Afghanistan pictures nowhere in it. See, imagine how much you've given up. And when we speak of Bharat, and when you look at archaeological evidence and whatnot, frankly speaking, while the Bhumi that we currently live in is certainly with that mothership of the lodestone or the epicenter, the actual expanse of Bharatiya culture is unimaginable. It goes right until Central Asia, where at one point, Turkish emperors used to call their Chakravartis with the title Dasharatha. The title given to the emperors of Turkic lineage was Dasharatha. The appropriation of certain characters in history by certain groups or identities is unbelievable. Changiz Khan was not a Muslim for the better part of his life. <laughs> he wasn't. The man was a practicing Buddhist. He was hated by followers of the one single unique God. So this is how much we understand of history, unfortunately. So I decided to treat, at the very least, 8th century as the cutoff point. As the cutoff point to understand how would a pre-colonial Bharat look like. Now that's where the argument gets slightly complicated. I'm so sorry, I'm just taking some time here. Because people might say, Hare then what do you make of Kanishka? What do you make of all these people who have come from Chinese tribes and so on and so forth? What you need to understand is, prior to the Abrahamic faiths occupying center stage, we are not saying that invasions did not take place. We are not saying that wars did not take place. All we are saying is that for the better part of it, polytheistic faiths have conquered perhaps for wealth, have conquered for material resources, but not for imposition of faith systems. That is the primary distinction. And second, Kanishka, who may have been, let's say, of some kind of Chinese uh, origin, is seen as part of our culture. Because it is a concept of assimilation, where at some stage, there is some kind of samanjasya here, where you decide that let's reconcile here, because he is not under any dying divine obligation, or he is not being ordained to impose his faith on anybody else. And consequently, in the absence of that scriptural injunction, there is no human obligation to do that. But when there is a scriptural in injunction, along with a divine incentive with about 72 uh, raisins, right, then obviously the entire equation changes. So which is why I have treated that particular period, notwithstanding all the assimilations and invasions, as the primary period to identify what is a post-colonial and a pre-colonial Bharat, how does it look and feel and smell. Now two, I have dedicated only some portion of the sixth chapter of the first book to this, but I have expanded on that significantly in the second book, given its uh, origins in terms of thinking, theology, political theology, what is the concept of a caliphate, and therefore what is the origin of the two nation theory, so on and so forth, that I have built in the second book. Now why is this important? Is it's impossible for us to understand the Bharati experience without uh, making a making sense of both these massive waves of settler colonization. Okay. What are the two major agriculture seasons in Bharat? Are Rabi and Kharif Indian birds? Where have they come from? Right. So is Tehsil an Indian word? Is Zila an Indian word? Is Taluk an Indian word? Hari bhai, but Urdu is Indian. Why do you say it's not an Indian word? Thank you for answering the question. So therefore the point is, look at the impact of all of this on language. It has made a difference to your language. It has made a difference to your agriculture calendar and seasons. You go to Delhi courts 
or most of the courts in, in the northern part of the country, Nayab Tehsil, Ahel Madh, these are the names of different posts in the lower judiciary. Now this is obviously coming from the Persianized Turkic Mughal experience, right? So when you look at such deep impacts, pointing out these impacts itself creates a lot of problem because people are wondering, if we spell it out, is there bound to be a cancel culture that I invite? Right? So that goes back to the first question that I had to take a slightly indirect approach to feed the very same uncomfortable truth. Because you see, medicine is bitter and stomachs are weak. So I had to prepare the stomach a bit. Right? This is great food. It's come from McDonald's. Eat it first. But McDonald's can there I put some idli. Right? And I said this is Mac idli. Because without the Mac you won't eat the idli. Because you'll frown on the idli. So I'll give it as Mac idli. At least that way you'll eat the damn idli. Right? So that's how I've decided to feed them. So I am very clear that to understand the British experience in exclusively as economic repression is typical Shashi Tharoor school of argument which I reject. That I have taken a very clear position on. Because it's surprising that you believe that these people were mere traders. Then what do you make of all the missionaries who came with them right from the very first visit? What do you make of the Konkan experience with respect to the destruction of temples? What do you make of the Mailapur temple? And why are so many churches established? Let's ask our, these basic questions. Who established this? Now the second thing is, again when we speak of the colonial experience, the other selectivity, so when, when it comes to the first colonized exp uh, experience which is the closest, you treat it as economic, you leave religion out of it. The worser aspect of your analysis is the experience preceding that is not even treated as colonization. It doesn't even figure in a discussion on colonization. That's even more blinkered and pixelated completely. It's completely airbrushed. Because whenever we think of the Mughals, we start thinking of uh, Amitabh Bachchan's voice in Jodha Akbar, where he starts saying, Mughal yam pe aaye, Bharat ko nawaza, yam pe baid gaye, ye lutere nahi the. A settler colonizer is being given credit for not being an invader or a looter. Imagine the problem with that, that entire principle. Someone who decides to stay here, occupy your home, is treated as being better than someone who loots and runs away. You see the vikriti in this, in this consciousness? So therefore I had to say, bhaiya, isme to itne sare parte lage hain, ek ek ko nikalna padega, I'll have to unpeel the onion gradually. I hope that's the answer to the question that was put. It's not a lawyer's answer to evade the question. I hope that's answered in your second book. Very bluntly. As candidly as possible, no punches held back, no holds barred, but within the bounds of civility and constitution. So maybe we'd like to have another session on second book. One interesting nugget. So the first book invited a lot of anger from a lot of people. Our own framework of decoloniality is now being applied in the context of Bharat. We never thought this would happen because serious attempts were made to keep this entire framework outside the Bharatiya discourse for at least four to five decades. This framework has been in existence at least since 1989, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. That's when the movement started in Latin America, when they started understanding why is the rest of the world caught in this crossfire between the Soviet bloc and the capitalist bloc. Don't we have an independent existence of our own? So that's when the question starts. Somehow, that scholarship never comes to Bharat at all. All sorts of woke garbage comes to Bharat. But that which is relevant to Bharat never enters Bharat. Right? And here's the interesting part. It's been August 23rd is when the second book was released. It's, way pa it's, it's well past the three month mark. Not a single person from the other side has fired a bullet so far. Not one bullet fired yet. I said, okay, like they did to Vikram Sampath, somebody will accuse me of plagiarism. Because I said, bhai, IP ka vakil I know my subject. Right? I am a product of Rajiv Gandhi School of Intellectual Property Law. Very proud product of that. <laughs> so you can't catch me on 
plagiarism, attribution, right? Footnoting. No, you can't. Sorry. I know the Western game very well when it comes to this. Imagine intellectual property and the principles of intellectual integrity are being taught to the rest of the world by the traditional looter of the world, which is the Western colonizer. <laughs> he goes about telling the rest of us, this is how footnoting is supposed to be done. This is how documentation is supposed to be done. Because you see, a thief needs to keep notes of how much he has stolen from the rest of the world, no? That's why. Second, well, I brought my legal training to four, which is to say, evidence, 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 document, 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 this is what he says, this is what he says. Their only accusation has been, Are primary source ko itna extract karke rakha hai, padne mein bahut mushkil ho hai. How much have you extracted the primary sources? Such a dry read. This is to ensure that you don't accuse me of selective extraction. This is to ensure that you don't say that my fascist tendencies are apparently, uh, let's say, helping me meet some confirmation bias, that I'm presenting facts to suit a particular ideology. No, I've taken away all those arguments. And the best part is I've cited their own material. Now, if at all you have, you have a problem, you should have a problem with the material that you guys have produced. Right? So, wh what I'm trying to tell you is, it's one thing to discuss facts, but I'm trying to expose the politics surrounding the discussion of facts. It is a different argument altogether. Assume for a moment you and I were fighting on the nuts and bolts of a particular factual nugget on historical evidence. It's a different issue altogether. But now, the fight is on whether I have the right to present my position in the first place. It's not even a question of whether my fact is right. It's on the ability to present that fact before the audience. Fortunately, those gates have been blasted open. They will never be shut again. Sri Saidipak ji and Professor Joyce in, uh, both of you have emphasized on first principles in your talks. Uh, could you share how first principles uh, can be used in the reinterpretation of uh, Indus Valley civilization as well as decolonization? First principles, I mean, after all, we don't know what the principles are, you know, and what are the first principles. I think first principle is something which is high up in the sky. We need to clarify a lot of things which remains here on the ground. And I, I just refer back to what Sai was saying. We are not very clear about your geographical space. You know, Sai was talking about Akhand Bharat, you know, the geographical space. You are familiar with the, with the word Sthan? Sthan? What does it mean? A place, a region, a, some kind of a geographical scape having some kind of a climate, some anthropology and everything. Look at the map of Asia, Hindustan. Pakistan, Registan, Rajasthan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and finally Turkistan, which shows Indian civilization existed definitely up to Turkistan. Is there a history book which has a map on this? Has any scholar in India paid? five minutes of time to draft a drawing on this and show it in some history book? Yes or no? No. Why? Why? Because we are afraid. Uh, because we are not very aware of the first principles. We don't know what these first principles are. When the colonial rulers come and tell Aryans by race, Aryan by skin colors, we simply accept them. There was a scientist born in India one of the disciples of J.C. Bose, very renowned scientist, and he ridiculed and said, oh, bed mein kya hai? Sab kya bed mein hota hai? He ridiculed. And somebody in Shantiniketan, you know where Shantiniketan is? You know, it's a town, a township or a satellite ashram founded by Gurudev Ravindranath. Somebody asked him, have you read the Vedas? And he became furious, as if he didn't have to read the Vedas for a single time and yet comment on the Vedas. This is Indian academics of sciences, you know. So we are not clear about your own principles, you know. We make comments and think we are scientific. Do you know what is the definition of science? Do I know what is the definition of science? What is the definition of science? Anyone here? What is the definition of science? Just science means experimentation, observation and inference. Is that all of it? Yeah, is science only reasoning? Reasoning what? Evaluated ideas? Fine. 
I'll make it short because we have a time constraint. Science means that there is a first principle far, far away, which is like an ocean. We are not aware of it. But some people have created a path because he is a chemist. And through chemistry, he has created a river of consciousness and he's exploring the metals and the compounds. And he's trying to find out that one metal through which, from which all the metals have been created. In other words, he's trying to find out that one unity in this world of chemistry. Same is it physics. What is the physicist doing? He's trying to find out that one force from where this entire universe has been created. What is a yogi doing? He's trying to find out that one principle from which this entire cosmos has been revealed, has been revealed, isn't it? So if you take a subset of all this set, what is common? And this is what Swami Vivekananda had said in the Parliament of Religion. The first speech, he said, Je jathamang prapantadde tans thegve bhajamaham mama vartanu vartanta pasha manusha sarvasha which means hey arjun whoever in whatever look at this lines of gita whoever in whatever space in whatever time and in whatever context have approached the truth either personally or approached me personally in different times finally lead to me lead to thee this is vikyana this is science this is, this is the first principle. So if you're a man of science, if you're a man of science, if you're an woman of science, let's be gender free. If you're an woman of science, you'll never ever ridicule any other person, other person without knowing what he or she is doing. So what Richard Feynman or Warner Heisenberg is trying to explore in the external laboratory of machines, mathematics, and algorithm, our rishis have explored that same truth for thousands of years in the internal laboratory of human mind. And this is where, when, Sa when Swami Vivekananda became famous after the parliament of religions, we have any idea who are the bunch of peoples who are interested to meet him? Any idea? They are not men of religion, they are men of science. It was scientist Nikola Tesla. It was Lord Kelvin. It was Hermann Helmholtz. They were the people, they were most anxious to meet him. Why? Because in that man, they could see a very special peculiarity about Indian Religion, which is just not religion or organized institutional religion. It is spirituality. Where there exists the first principle of being and becoming. So, you become what you believe. When I'm talking about a child on the road, I'm just talking about the child without having any idea about where the child is from, which family, what is his language, what is his economic level. Where does it belong to? But when the mother talks about the child, she speaks with all the knowledge, the biological knowledge of the child itself. Is it clear to all of you? So that means the internal conception of the child has become the external ideas of the child itself. This is Indian spirituality. This is the first principle. This is the first person inquiry which Richardi and many other sages of India talk about again and again. And this is what had fascinated a man called Warner Heisenberg. And in 1929, he was, he's from Germany. And, uh, and we have someone from Germany here. And uh, Heisenberg, you know, he came all the way from Germany to Kolkata Science Congress to meet Tagore. And he just simply asked a question, what these very lines that you have spoken we have found all of that after doing so many computations and so many analytics and working with whatever machines that had existed at that point of time when Heisenberg was there. How could you, how could you write this poetry which has become the lines of Gitanjali? 
How could you rhythm the truths of the cosmos and almost say the same things? I'll just recite a poem. He said, Shimar Maji Oshim to me. Within the finite, there is the infinite. Within the little boy, there is the whole family. Within the yogi, there is the vast divinity. Within one range of the Himalaya, if I touch that, I touch the whole of the Himalaya. If I go to Haridwar and touch Mother Ganga, I touch the whole of Ganga. I don't have to run from Gangotri to Ganga Sagar to get a whole idea of reductionist view of the Ganga itself. This is the greatness of this country. And this is the first principle. And this is the first principle which has been talked about by our Vedic sages who have said so beautifully. And it vibrates even today. Ekam Sad Bipra. There is only one truth, but that truth is infinite, impersonal, universal. But that is only manifested in various ways. Of which one of the most earliest expression is Hinduism. Whose mother is the Vedic religious idols? From where flew a much later religion, which is the principle of Jarathustra, which is a portion of the Atharva Veda. And it is from the Atharva Veda it finally decomposed into the three Semitic religions of Judaism and then Islam on this side of the Red Sea and Christianity on the other side of the Red Sea. If you say that and if you bring that truth, then the power to proselytize, the power to convert does not remain. So you have to suppress the first principle and you have to forge an Aryan invasion myth and make them look very superior so that when they come to India, we fall at their feet and we become a slave of the third principle. We become a slave of the third principle. I just put it in my way so that what exactly is the first principle, it becomes clear. So this is a protest which is forwarded by all the great sages of India. I'll just name a few. I think one person who stands behind this book is Sri Aurobindo. You know. And Aurobindo is probably the first person in the history of humankind who, who had the guts, who had the temper, who had the academic gnostic and the spiritual knowledge to fast forward the first principle through his book the secret of the Vedas. So in this book, there is an annexture. I was so happy Sai, about Sai talking his book, which gave me a permission to talk about my book also. So there's a fourth annexure, which is on the secret of the Vedas. So when you look at the secret of the Vedas, you understand that the word Arya or Arjo is by the quality of mind. So from the material mind, which is tamasic, you're becoming a more active mind, which is rajasic. And from there, you're becoming a contemplative or a more refined mind, which is swatik. And the swatik mind just gives you the first machineries or the first principles to transcend the first principle and go, and go behind the three gunas, which is tama, raja, and swatta. And then you reach the highest level which is self-actualization. And that takes us, on the one hand, to Sri Aurobindo's hierarchy of minds, and also takes us to a brilliant idea which has been propagated by a great transpersonal psychologist. His name is Abraham Maslow, the hierarchy of needs. Through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the secrets of the Vedas have been unfolded. The first principles have been unfolded. So today a time has come when as Sai has used the Western quotation to actually defend his own ideas, a time has come to very intelligently select all these wonderful works actually been done by the Western scholars in a beautiful way through which you can recover the first principles of being and becoming. Thank you. Can I just add to what uh, Sir has just said? See, there are two ways in which you can look at this entire issue broadly. 
one think of this as a narrow minded parochial identity related battle or you go a step further and as students of this great institution understand what is called as the geopolitics of knowledge which is to say there is a fact now knowledge is not just about knowing about that particular fact but also the manner in which you look at that particular fact it is the lens that you wear now why is this important today when we speak of reason logic scientific temper so on and so forth these are all aspects which have been cast in a particular mold and any idea that refuses to fit in that particular template is rejected as irrational unscientific and even worse superstitious there's a beautiful uh, recent podcast how many people watch the podcast of joe rogan please do please do watch there's a very recent podcast where he is uh, discussed the history of several ancient civilizations with a british archaeologist who goes on to say that once you realize that there have existed several civilizations during each of these uh, ice ages and we know very little you will be forced to recalibrate the timeline of human civilization entirely and not just that the worst mistake that we keep doing when we try and deconstruct or try to understand how the pyramid was built or how for that matter let's give a bharati example the bridishura temple was built you are trying to apply your contemporary understanding of physics and civil engineering to what would have happened then without asking yourself whether this paradigm of, of science which we take for granted today is the paradigm of science that would have existed then so therefore what do you ask yourself for this to have happened there should have been multiple elephants elephants which should have rolled each of these boulders through logs and it should have gone to this particular height that is you applying contemporary thinking based on your assumption that a certain technology did not exist in the past and you are retrofitting your current understanding of science to the past without asking yourself what if they have uh, approached this entire problem in a very different way which perhaps even militates your contemporary understanding of science the reason why this becomes very very crucial and this is where i think the real battle is is indic knowledge systems indian knowledge systems constantly have to fight the battle of having to prove themselves on the anvils of western understanding of science so what happens then is you are forced to even look at this particular scientific approach or, or let's say our contributions through the western lens which would be equally bad because it's almost as if you're saying that when i indigenize indian scientific literature all i'm doing is translating something that has existed into indian languages without asking whether this is the manner in which they should be approached in the first place each of our philosophical darshanas each of the shat darshanas have their own implications on how we have taken it forward in the form of science and technology and therefore it may be impossible to even make sense of indian scientific contributions as long as the western paradigm is up, is applied to it now the mistake that you're going to make as part of this discussion is to say science is science is me western kya hai indian kya hai no not at all completely wrong the manner in which you have a particular philosophy is the reason why you arrive at the concept of shunya the way you understand your relationship with the supreme consciousness your place in the entire cosmos is the reason that you decide to come with a particular concept called shunya it has got everything to do with your way of life it's got everything to do with the philosophy that you believe in it's got everything to do with how you see the supreme consciousness so when someone says science is science you there are two let's say problems with it one it completely ignores the anthropological evolutionary and cultural aspects of science completely and the second thing that it does is that it 
treats one particular template as universal and therefore it, it submerges everything else under the carpet. Finished. That's the end of the matter. So that means you will never look at Ayurveda on its own terms. Ayurveda will have to prove itself on the anvils of allopathic empirical evidence. So therefore, clinical trial studies, so on and so forth, the way you look at how a molecule is developed in traditional, let's say in western pharmaceutical science, is the model that you choose to see superimpose on Ayurveda without asking whether this is right. Is this fair? Because you have told yourself, if it's a quality standard, this is the benchmark. If it's an empirical standard, this is the benchmark. If there is rigor, this is the benchmark. There ends the discussion after that. So perhaps when you look at all these workshops which are happening under the umbrella of IKS, the first thing is not the content of the substance, but the manner of seeing, the manner of approaching, the mode of learning. That is the radical change that is required, which is to say, it's a complete rewiring. And you can't rewire unless you unlearn. The problem with unlearning is, your existing set of realities will be upset. <laughs> Placements affect ho jayenge. MS affect ho jayega. Nokri chala jayega. Aap Stanford mein jaake IKS ki baat pakka kar sakte hai. Take it from me. It's just that you can't tell this to your own colleague here. That is the difference. You will be able to speak of IKS in a foreign country with the confidence. You know why? Because currently white guilt translates to them having to accommodate diversity. They are they're scared of the label of xenophobia and racism. And the man lo bhai, varna pata nahi si racist ka tag lag jayega. Right? But in this country, you won't be able to do it. Because the moment you open your mouth, so a few days ago, I was told, I don't wish to take names here because how much more controversial can I get? So I'll just keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> so, uh, a dear friend of mine, Ami Ganatra, who's written this book on Mahabharata and Ramayana, uh, is on the campus. One distinguished gentleman didn't know who she was or what she does. And apparently she was asked to introduce herself and she was introduced as the author of these two books. In this day and age, who writes a book on Ramayana and Mahabharata? And this is from a person of Indian extraction, Indian origin, who has done well for himself outside this country. And then she had to throw her qualifications at him. I am a product of IIM Ahmedabad, this and that and all that. Only then, oh, oh, then it must have some meaning to it. Until then, Ramayana and Mahabharata have no value until the tag of I am Ahmedabad goes along with it, you see. That is the problem and that proves the central thesis of my book of coloniality. Which is, you are not even willing to look at your own scripture on its own merits unless the tag of an organization which was set up in post-independent Bharat is associated with something that is at least, at the very least, 5000 years old. What Mera Bharat Mahan, I don't understand. I think this is where you have to start decolonializing yourself. The battle is about knowledge. The battle is about whether I have equal breathing space on the negotiating table when there is a discussion on philosophy, on political culture, on economics, on science, on rationality, on reason, logic, temper, so on and so forth. I still don't have an equal space. Because I am expected to go through the very same success and failure model of the West. The West will do something, they'll say, oh, this is great, we'll say, this is great. Then they'll realize, oh, if this was a complete failure, then we'll come back to the very same failure. So the rest of the world has no other option but to follow the West in all its trial and errors. So they have the power of ideation, we are the empirical data, period. So, uh, Sai, we have seen that uh, in our current constitution, it is basically about protecting the individual rights or it's giving the primacy to the individual rights. And the only uh, group rights that it tries to protect is of uh, minority rights or the linguistic uh, minority rights. However, in a civilizational state, it is more about group rights. And I think you also talk about it in your book. 
so how do you see that uh, raising a civilizational state or uh, you know uh, reimagining a civilization state is possible within the current constitutional framework or do you think we need a different uh, you know uh, a larger amendment or a different constitution number one second that since these are group rights and all similarly british having a similar kind of conformity makes sense because they had to rule but indian constitution having uh, more diversity wouldn't uh, and in that light how would you talk on ucc in the same light i think our confession is in order which is from the first book to the second book my learning curve has been significant so which is why my own positions with respect to the constitution have changed significantly from the first book to the second book therefore i will not spell out any kind of prescriptions with a certain degree of uh, certainty or certitude until i'm done with the exercise and the exercise will be done in the 75th year of the republic which is 2025 therefore i will hold back the answer on that but i have made a few tentative suggestions in the first book so let me try and give the context to the uh, to the listeners here so that they get a clear picture of what we are saying so assume for a moment that you live in a largely homogeneous society in terms of race language and religion and you're looking at the concept of a nation state in europe post the westphalian treaty and therefore you have catholic states you have protestant states within uh, protestant states you have lutheran states calvinist states so on and so forth and therefore the hold of catholic christianity on christendom is loosened and you have more than one acceptable official denomination now which is protestantism and catholicism now in that particular light you have protestant states and catholic states and then you have linguistic identities within each, within each of these territories so given that degree of homogeneity there is no particular group which needs to protect itself because it's largely a similar identity then your for the uh, let's say the basic component of the population becomes the individual 100 people exist in a room 100 people come from the same racial stock the same religious denomination speak the same language no one person needs to protect the existence of his language against the rest of the 99 people right now out of those 100 people assuming 10 people come from a slightly different racial stock speak a different language then is the concept of minority rights where european states effectively say as a state we are catholic or protestant but we will protect the rights of these denominational minorities that's how the majority minority discussion started as part of european discourse now let's go a step further think of it as bharat every 10th person comes from a slightly different linguistic back background plus since it's part of the sanatan dharmic fold every 10th person has a different sampradaya although within the same sanatana dharma think of it as 108 denominations within the dharmic fold and each sampradaya is a self sufficient or a self contained code in itself which is to say that sampradaya is capable of replacing the whole for that particular community therefore that sampradaya is hindu dharma for them they don't need to go beyond that sampradaya for their spiritual solace material solace or communal solace so on and so forth now in which case every 10 persons would want to protect their identity against the rest of the nine groups right when you're looking at that kind of diversity then it's no more the individual who becomes the basic unit it becomes each group because each group is trying to protect itself against the other group so that there is no imposition of language there is no imposition of sampradaya so on and so forth vaishnavites don't, don't want any imposition by shaivites then shaktas don't want imposition by the vaishnavites and the shaivites all of this happens so therefore when you look at a civilizational state this particular portion of my book maybe i could have written better but this is the most misunderstood or mischievously understood by quite a set of people because they've they've understood this to say 
that I am basically arguing for a communist kind of experience where individual rights shall be submerged at the altar of group rights. That's not my position. My position is, in contrast to a homogeneous nation state, in a civilization state there is multiple or let's say there is greater diversity and therefore there are more number of groups. So in a nation state, the state can be preoccupied with individual rights. But in a civilizational state where there is more diversity, the primary preoccupation will be the group right. And therefore what I have said is, in a civilizational state, the state has two obligations. Protecting group rights as well as protecting individual rights. And where there is a conflict between the individual right and the group right, the group is going to say, if out of 10 people in a particular group, one person says, I will dilute the identity of the group. You are not just endangering your position, you are endangering the position of the rest of us in this group, qua the rest of the community. And therefore in such a situation, that individual's right will have to give way to that particular group's right. Otherwise, it, it ends up becoming, let's say, uh, they end up losing their identity. I will give you a very clear example. Where is this entire argument coming from? from the Sabarimala experience. Think of Sabarimala as one particular Sampradaya. One person says that an established tradition for a thousand years, I will change because my individual right must prevail over the rights of the tradition and the rest of the community and that particular Sampradaya. And that person doesn't even say in the petition that he or she is a believer in the deity. Why should you have access to a particular place of worship? if you are not a believer in that particular deity. Can you enter a cinema theatre without hoping to abide by the rules of the cinema theatre? No, you can't. You can do whatever you want when you are watching a movie in the confines of your home. But when you choose to enter a public place, you have to respect the rights of everybody else. Now I am saying if that applies to a cinema theatre, are you telling me that the very same rights do not apply in the context of a religious institution which has sanctity, which has notions of purity. Of course, religious institutions have the right to maintain notions of purity. If it offends your sentiments, your sentiments can take a hike. Doesn't matter. If a place of worship cannot have the right to preserve its purity, which place will have the right to preserve its purity? <laughs> Basic questions. Some halls, I am told here, have rules that you can't walk into the messes uh, with shorts. You have to wear trousers. You can preserve your tradition with respect to walking into a mess. But believers don't have the right to preserve what is so sacred to that energy space. Look at the argument. So in that context I said, if it is the conflict between one individual's right of access to that particular temple, if you are a believer, you will not question the tradition, you will subscribe by the rules. If you are not a believer, you don't have any skin in the game. You have no local standard to argue at all in the, in the first place. You cannot have access to that particular place. In such a situation, the right of that particular sampradaya and its followers will prevail over the rights of that particular individual. That is the context in which I made that statement. It is not meant to stifle individual dignity. It is not meant to stifle basic freedoms or fundamental freedoms of the individual. But the calculus will change from a nation state to a civilization state. Which is why I said, Bharat cannot subscribe to principles of nation statism which apply to European states. And European states today cannot afford to stick to their own principles of you know, nation statism thanks to multicultural identities even within Europe today. So they have to reevaluate everything. And Bharat has always had to live with this reality because that's the lived experience of Bharat. So in that context, I would therefore say, as long as you try and look at Bharat through the experience of Europe, Language identities will suffer, regional identities will suffer, linguistic diversity will suffer, cultural diversity will suffer, sampradayak diversity will suffer, everything will suffer. So that cannot happen. Second, a civilizational state ideally should not have only 26 languages in its constitution and cannot have only two languages for its business transaction. Terrible. What message are you sending to everybody else? Right? So, I genuinely believe that Bharat's constitution is the product of a multiple personality disorder. 
which is to say two people or uh, let's say people with their legs in two different boats who are straddling two different boats are the ones when they draft they transmit the consciousness onto the document also so in the second book i've come out all guns blazing explaining the dual consciousness so one of the tallest leaders of the so called movement around that period can i take the time may i yeah is is now called rashtrapita on official website and all that i don't uh, is surendranath banerji who is a product of bengal now surendranath banerji had such serious pride in his origins as a kulin brahman from bengali bengali extraction and also goes on to say that i am a patriot of the first order of the british empire and that bharat's destiny and its future success is contingent on bharat riding on the coattails of britain and being a part of the english empire look at the compartmentalization in those head spaces then very comfortably saying this is my origin and this is my allegiance that means the direct impact of colonization is creating a cognitive dissonance in the minds of the colonized society where you are unable to see the conflict between the two identities that you subscribe to and you think you can reconcile now if that is the product let's say and he lived in the early 1900s 1835 was the first minute where english education is introduced in bharat so 1835 to 1900 you're looking at 65 years after 65 years if this is the experience are you surprised in 2022 the experience is even worse in 65 years that's roughly two and a half generations this is the product so by 1947 what do you think would have been the case by 2000 what would have been the case by 2022 what would have been the case no wonder you need to sell ramayana mahabharata with i am amdavad right so i am therefore of the very clear view that the constitution needs a hit reset from a very different perspective it most questions are can we reduce the length of the constitution why do we have so many amendments these are stupid questions according to me fundamentally stupid questions the question is whether the approach to this particular concept has bharatiyata in it does it partake from our philosophies when it comes to uh, let's say phil politics so on and so forth what was the reference point for article 14 you're looking at amendment 14 of the us constitution then for uniform civil code you're looking at somewhere else the irish constitution becomes the reference point for bharat french constitution becomes the reference point for bharat Czechoslovakian constitution becomes the reference point of Bharat. Smallest of republics, which are not even the size of Kerala, I'm so sorry to speak, are going to be the reference point for Bharat. So my entire question is: When they were looking at this, did they refer to any shastras, any dharma sutras, any works which spoke of our philosophy? If not, the independent slave has continued to build a state. using the tools of the master we can now open the floor for q and a there has been a spurge of energy in the country regarding the revival of indian culture uh, let me call it as bharatiya sanskriti so this sanskriti is nothing without sanskrit but the elimination of sanskrit which was not even possible by the foreign invaders which we have done in the name of modernity and advancement seems irrevocable today even the mother languages are at threat so how will sanskrit come back how will india come back it is it inevitable that we with our ignorance and mental slavery to the west lose such a great scientific language like sanskrit the great literary spiritual scientific heritage of india is it not possible before i die that i see a few youngsters here at iit khadakpur discussing some science in sanskrit so there is a slight uh, problem with the framing of the question sanskrit will live the question is whether it will live in bharat okay sanskrit will live because the global thief has understood the value of sanskrit long ago he has set up chairs in all these western institutions precisely for this to start the process of co-option to start the process of adoption to effectively what i would call baptism 
which is to take it away gradually. That process has long started. Our innovation theory that Sir spoke of is part of that entire philosophy. So the you have to realize how this mind works. This mind is basically saying, if I find something of value in your culture, which is capable of universal application, I will first take away your right to lay claim on it. And therefore, its pitrutva, its paternity will be mine. Says the father of intellectual property principles. Right? Attribution, this is how they do, they go about it. Why is that nothing of value should ever be traceable to your culture? Right? And even if it does, you should not have the right to claim it as your own. Hence the process of secularization of arts, the process of secularization of Bharatiya traditions, what not. That's exactly how it works. So don't be worried for the, the, the existence of Sanskrit. It will live. It is Deva Bhasha. It can't die. Whether it will live in the land of Devas is the question. And therefore, as a realist optimist, a question coming from a student of IIT Khadakpur such as this would have been impossible and unimaginable perhaps a decade ago. I couldn't have left this room without, a, let's say, a slew of allegations against me given my answers. Nobody would have dared to publish my books. Okay? That means the window has shifted. Now that window has shifted to two things. Shraddhanjali to all those people who died unheard after doing their best over the last 70 years. They were not fighting an outsider, they were fighting an insider-outsider. So our first job as dharmics is to recognize the contributions of the greats of the past. And then count your blessings that you've, you've, you're fortunate to live in that particular window of history where you can see this transition happening, which is why I'm so excited that this is going to be the battleground generation. We are at a crossroads. So you're looking at a Literally, this is Arya Parkiladai. If this 25-year window from now onwards, effectively, I would say 2019, I wouldn't even say 2014, 2019 onwards, roughly by 2047, if Bharat regains its ability to confidently assert its roots and which doesn't translate to exclusion of any kind, but a firm, confident assertion of the self, I think the job is done for the better part of it. So I am very confident of one thing, that the right questions are being asked. There is hunger for the right kind of content, operative word being right. And therefore, I am not someone who is who's, who's pessimistic about the future. That said, I understand the lay of the land in terms of the challenges ahead. It must come to a point that when you're dealing with a pandemic, you don't force Ayurvedic practitioners and their diagnosis to be sent to an allopathic practitioner for a second opinion. The day you have the confidence that even during a pandemic, your indigenous medicine systems are capable of doing the job as opposed to treating them as the stepney, that day I would say is when Bharat has truly arrived. Because until then, it is only symbolism. Until then, it's only symbolism. You will talk about history. You will talk about temples. Important. Absolutely important. No problem. But when it comes to practical application of it in a, in a way where it affects economics, where it affects health, do you have the confidence to walk the talk and the courage of your conviction that this will see us through? China had the confidence to do that with respect to Chinese medicine systems after having exported the beautiful virus to the rest of the world. Bharat did not have the confidence. It was a fantastic opportunity to mainstream Ayush. Ayurveda should have been at the forefront of it. I spoke to quite a few practitioners around that particular period. They were like, I am a second grade practitioner in this country where my prescription will now go to an allopathic practitioner 
for vetting is would that be acceptable to any other stream of profession i don't think so that's exactly where the challenge is so don't look at it only from the perspective of language i would say language is important but even when it comes to downright application related issues do you have the confidence i would say we are still not there we are going in that particular direction i genuinely hope that iks gradually starts not just producing literature from an archival perspective which is important because that's where we are at this point to understand what existed but then it translates to very serious application of those knowledge systems and those thought processes and modes of sensing and understanding to contemporary problems how do you apply that logic to policy making from the perspective of sustainable development how do you apply that from the perspective of this growth based market development can bharat sustain this beyond a point these are questions which i'm sorry to say western models do not have the answer to because they are not based on contentment they are based on perpetual growth and they are based on rampant consumption and in the process it will leave this particular let's say this planet completely sucked dry of its resources incapable of existence after a point then we'll all have to look to elon musk to give us the next vehicle to go to mars which i don't think is a very responsible thing to do so i am saying your micro question and the macro issue are related so i think uh, maybe in, in the next 5 or 6 years people like me our work may become obsolete because then the discussion would have moved from the politics of the issue to the issue itself which is what is the necessity at this point we are gatekeepers we are dwarapalas trying to protect the people who are doing their jobs the hope is when the people doing their jobs get center stage and our jobs are done over the purpose of existence is complete over so uh, this is about funding of uh, christian missionaries for conversion particularly so i read about the fcra law right and i'm not a law student so i don't understand what exactly it implies but what is the scenario right now and what what are the methods that you would suggest to uh, you know stop the flow of illegal even illegal uh, funds to these missionaries so when fcra was being discussed several years ago i had the opportunity to work on it very briefly as part of giving certain comments for a particular group uh, but beyond that there is a serious uh, paucity of knowledge on my part to be able to comment on it beyond that okay so i want to place that caveat on record because as lawyers people think that we are capable of speaking on every aspect of every law no we are not it's as bad or as good as asking a urologist to speak on something related to heart okay so i'm not going to do that i have a slightly different uh, take on this and you have to consider this so what happens is uh, you are trying to address the means as opposed to addressing the end goal which is you are effectively addressing all the means and methods through which conversion is achieved as opposed to taking a very clear conscious position on the issue of conversion itself at a national level and you're running away from this particular question as perhaps one of the few surviving indigenous pagan heathen civilizations you don't seem to have the right to take a position against conversion that is a reflection of the lopsided nature of the discourse today and apparently constitutional freedoms and constitutionalism can be used to subvert civilizational identity itself that seems to be the argument which is the document will be alive but the civilization will be dead operation successful patient dead right that is exactly why the purpose of my exercise through the book is to say that the book that you do this ashtanga namaskar before is meant to protect what remains of the civilization but somehow we are intent on protecting the book at the expense of the civilization and any talk of civilization invites all sorts of ad hominem allegations and therefore why shouldn't this country have a categorical position with respect to 
conversion from its native faith systems to non-native faith systems. Why is that discussion such a politically incorrect controversial topic to discuss? Why are believers and worshippers of free speech constantly trying to gag, stifle and silence this discussion? You seem to be comfortable discussing every possible thing under the sun, including the character of Sri Ram, the character of our deities, the sexual orientation of our deities. These were the questions raised with respect to Ayapa's celibacy. How do you know for a fact that he is attracted only to women? These were the questions that were put to me. Right? Now when you think it's okay for you to ask these kind of questions, well I should be at the very least allowed to ask this question, why can't I protect what is native to this land? Simple. Right? So, perhaps one of the things that in my little way what I am trying to do is to normalize controversial discussions and to make it possible to have a vocal conversation, a very clear honest conversation on it with a very clear, uh, let's say, rule. Don't cross lines of civility, use facts as much as possible and determine the rules of engagement here, but the topic will not be pixelated under any circumstances. So address the question of conversion in its entirety and ask yourself what has been the experience of other colonized societies? How were Greece and Rome Christianized? And how their oracles and, and their priestesses were branded in the same way as Devadasis in our temples? And how these practices were completely taken out of context and distorted? Look at all that experience and you'll realize the same tried and tested template that's been applied across the world has, is being applied in Bharat. And the only reason that you don't know it is because you don't understand the global nature of this history. So, greater historical awareness, the confidence and the knowledge to articulate these positions perhaps will lead to some of these solutions. Thus far, I know for a fact that these SCRA regulations have done nothing on the ground. There are instances where some individuals in certain parts of the south are able to secure funds to the tune of 300 to 500 crores, individuals, not even organizations. 300 to 500 crores and this is apparently after tightening FCRA regulations. Then I wonder what would have been the situation before and how much of money entered this country. I request Professor Sain and uh, uh, Shri Sai to make their closing remarks if any. Please keep them brief. I think all of you know between 1991 and 1997, about 15 million people were killed in Eastern Europe in the Balkan, Herzegovina and Serbian war, which is almost like one third of the Second World War. But the world did not notice because a certain group, group of the three Semitic religions was trying to get rid of another group of the Semitic religions in Eastern Europe. And today, the war that we see in Ukraine, the war that we see in Ukraine is an extension of that war that we had in the 90s. And today, Europe has created its own grave, grave. And it has created the whole linkage so bad, geopolitically so morbid and so weak that the natural trade and the economic routes within and around Europe is automatically coming to a zero point. And European products, European infrastructure are all almost outdated. If you go to most of the European cities, including the American cities, the problem of the Western economy today is not to build new infrastructure, but to maintain the old infrastructure that was made in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. If you go to New York City specifically right now, about 90% of the New York City bridges are outdated. And the Municipal Council of New York City is absolutely getting money from the surrounding states like New Jersey and all that. It's a reality. When I did my masters uh, in the state of Iowa, the capital city of Des Moines had a homelessness of 16% say. And today it has crossed 20%. Yeah, so it's comparable to the thresholds of a developing or an underdeveloped country. When you look at the visa situation right now, you know, the visas are being turned down to Europe and the US. Is it, is it 
a political economic decision? No, there's so much of problem within those countries right now that the sweet romantic Europe and the industrially advanced America where I was trained, I have to be grateful, cannot afford tourism or parents visiting their sons and daughters. So there are huge problems within the Western economy. Why? Because the West has created a civilization based on the reductionist approach. And everything is reduced to a full-scale growth and exploitation of the nature. And the whole ball game, you know, the, the tail of the serpent, you know, the mouth of the serpent was towards Asia and the tail of the serpent was in the sky. But right now, the tail of the serpent is in Asia and then the mouth of the serpent has returned back to the West. And if you look at, if you look at the Western economy as such, there is a very powerful prediction by the WEF which the West cannot afford, which says by, that by the year 2035, 2035, about 70% of the world economy will be mostly concentrated in the Asia Pacific, including South Asia. Can the West afford this? You know, if you see China, this is a live stream, if you see China as a devil's advocate, if you see China as a devil's advocate, it is actually playing the role of an agency which cannot be played by others, not by a good Indian. It can be played by a very strong Chinese person. So it's creating the lips and bounds in the global economy which the West could not conceive. You know, I'll just give you a simple example and I'll end there. Long, long back, Asia had a wisdom, had a wisdom and Europe transcended that by the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution. Simple. And then the civilization crossed the Atlantic, went rich New York, Chicago, and finally, when we are just getting out of college, the Bay Area was coming up. So if you look at the journey of civilization, it's very simple, and it's, it's following the rays of the sun. You know. It's crossing Asia, you know, getting into Greece, Rome, Paris. Is Paris burning? And then a Titanic leaves Paris to rich New York. Everything leads to New York. In the 70s and the 80s, when I was a student at IIT Kharagpur, I saw most of the scholarships not coming from the eastern seaboard, but also coming from the, from, the, from the Californian Silicon Valley. It was a rise of electronics industries. If you look at the 90s and the 2000 and the late 2000, the entire silicon industry has been transshipped to the Asia Pacific. There are more computers and more laptops and more iPhones which are actually controlled by the economies of the Asia Pacific. If you look at WHO specifically, the strictures and the dictums and the policies of WHO are more controlled by China and other Asian countries than they were controlled by the European and American monopoly a decades back. So I cannot go like this. I think I've made my point clear. So what has happened, you don't have to solve the problem. The problem itself is solving the problem. Why? Because the West, for some reason, we are not against the West. I am trained in the West. Sai is trained in the West. But much of West has been so arrogant and so reductionist that the resources of exploitation with which it has exploited Asia has become the same forces with which it is getting self-exploited. And today, uh, if you read Oswald Spengler, did the decline of the West, and I'm just mentioning some books. If you read, which comes from a planning turf, uh, it's, it's a book called The Cities and the Wealth of Nations, written by Jane Jacobs. Uh, I mean, all these are all Western authors, they have said, the history of the West is just 500 years, you know. I'm coming back to where I started. The history of the West is just fall of Granada, 1492 to maybe 2192 maximum. Because the West could not build on the basic wisdom. It could not build its civilization on the first principles of civilization. It has always 
Please try to understand what I'm saying. It has always forged and manipulated and otherwise proved itself to be superior, which if was corrected, the West could have been a large contributor of uh, global civilization. So we don't have to worry about the West. The West is digging its own grave. But the problem which Sai said uh, in the middle portion of his deliberation is that many of us educated Indians, including people in IIT Kharagpur, we are not aware of these things. You know. We are not update. We are not aware of the latest Nobel Prizes, which runs in physics, 2022, which proves the ancient wisdom of interconnectedness of the universe, quantum entanglement. We are not aware of the Nobel Prize of 2017 in physiology, which has proved circadian rhythm, the ancient wisdom of pranayama, of the yoga, which has come within the purview of the West. So when a left-wing critic or a professor at IIT Kharagpur is criticizing Sai's book and my book without any fault or any remark, it's a problem of not being updated because we are just updated with a 200 years old Newtonian, Cartesian, Francis Baconian and a, and a Sigmund Freudian and a Charles Darwinian and a Francis Galtonian version of science, which is vanishing from the face of the earth. And it's replaced by the ideas of Maslow, by the ideas of quantum electrodynamics of Richard Feynman, by the ideas of quantum nanochemistry of Elia Prejogine, by the ideas of quantum physics by Alan Aspect, and by the ideas of Jeffrey Hall, which is the circadian rhythm, and many, and many, and many more. This is the new science which is rising in the West, which perfectly echoes and vibrates with the first principle of Indian ancient wisdom. So we are in crossroads. This is a golden age which is in the offing. So let us be very hopeful. Thank you. So one of my earliest conversations with Professor Sen, when I was here in law school, and I think this was at his residence, uh, as part of the Vivekananda study circle, I don't know if sir remembers this, we were uh, having a conversation on, uh, why don't we prove the historicity of the Mahabharata and the Vedas? That was my naive question at that point. Why don't we date it properly? Why don't we prove that we are the oldest? So sir's simple question was, why do we need to prove that? What are we looking at here? What is this competition here that you're trying to prove that you're the oldest? What difference does it make? Was that, let's say, where the Vedas compiled to prove that we are the oldest or the greatest? Or is the message of that particular compilation different from what you're making it to be? I've had that realization after a very long time. Because until then, I was what? I was 20 in here. By the time I left the place, I was 23. So I was like, no, no, we have to prove this. We have to prove this. The lawyer wanted to present the evidence, right? Now, today we live, fortunately, in an age where you have scholars like Vishwa Adluri and others effectively saying the entire approach to Mahabharata and its dating and its historicity is so flawed because that reeks and smacks of Western frameworks being applied to Indic works. Now then the question from here is, is this then a fight between the bat, uh, let's say the West and the East? No, that's not the point being made here. Any philosophy, any position, any ideology, any opinion that pits it itself against nature and cosmological balance, pits itself against time, and pits itself against, how do I put it, universal consciousness. So our entire fight is, you have been ravaging nature so much, your entire model is built on ravaging of nature so much, 
that if you think you alone are going to pay the price for it, no, all of us are going to pay the price for it because as sir said, we are all interconnected. Nature is interconnected. Why is this conversation so important in an institution that is dedicated to the pursuit of science and technology? Because you are going to determine development and definitions of development and metrics of development and its impact on nature. You might come out with fantastic machines to drill and bore mountains. But do, will you have the vivek and the wisdom to ask, is this needed? What is its impact? <laughs> Unless you ask that question, as a country which lives in or which is located in a biosensitive region, we will pay a huge price. So think of the IK system as perhaps an attempt to reorient your compass towards Prakriti and towards nature without being Luddite in our position, which is to say we are not anti-development. We are just saying at the very least redefine and recast development, freeing it of its Western definitions, which are based on, as Sir rightly points out, the Cartesian philosophy of placing man over nature, as opposed to man as part of nature. And the reason why I use man is not because I'm a misogynist, but because that philosophy places one particular gender at the top of the food chain. And it's not us who does, who, who does it. So my only request would be, these are not the conversations of the well-fed and the pastime of the well-fed. These have very real implications for you in terms of policy making. If that basic dharmic compass and filter is absent in your decision making policy or let's say decision making process, you might have created great cities. You would have created everything which perhaps will not even last 500 years. And therefore, revisiting definitions of technology, development, all of this is absolutely crucial. Dharmic philosophies place a premium on Prakriti. Today, I, uh, I think I was uh, walking past the old building, the museum, and then the Hijli camp. And that portion, I think, on the other side of the, uh, the old locomotive engine is so green. It's still so green with old trees. It is perhaps one of those meditative spots on the campus. Imagine what kind of uh, civilization you have inherited where you have cracked the code of the relationship between elevation of the consciousness and nature that you choose not to make tourism spots out of Himalayas and you choose to make them spots where you go for meditation and contemplation. And today these are the very same places where you have four lane ways and six lane ways and you have people going there in such droves and you have commercialized the place so much. Three consequences, energy sanctity, which you don't understand anymore, the consecrated space is out of the window. Along with that, uh, natural balance is out of the window. It's a pain to go from Delhi to Shimla, I've said this so often. It's really a pain to go from Delhi to Shimla. The moment you go there and you see the garbage being piled on the sides. So how, this is how we have decided to define technology. We will use technology to address a problem that we have created as opposed to asking how do we stop creating that problem in the first place because stopping the creation of the problem would mean putting a fetter on your consumption patterns which means your bottom line is hit immediately as an individual and as a company. I am not a card carrying communist. I am not a leftist. At the same time, I don't need to subscribe to western model of capitalism under any circumstances. I come back to the golden mean of Bharat. Strike a balance.